Okay, and we are on air. So thank you everyone for joining us for another Ask Me Anything event hosted by the ASLA Emerging Professionals Committee. And um, today I'm Amy Severson. I'm on the ASLA Emerging Professionals Committee as well as landscape designer at Land Collective. I'm joined by Chelsea Keith. Hello. Chelsea. And of course, <laughs> our uh, we're so excited to be joining Shannon Nickel today. Hey, Shannon. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Great. So I have um, a little bio here. Shannon Nickel is a founding partner of Gustafson Guthrie Nickel. Her designs, including Millennium Park's Lurie Garden, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation campus, and Boston's North End Parks, are widely recognized for being deeply embedded in their neighborhoods and not natural contexts. Shannon's work incorporates complex functions into simple frameworks and refined landforms. Shannon's recent and current projects include Lower Rainier Vista and Pedestrian Land Bridge at the University of Washington, India Basin Waterfront Park in San Francisco, Seattle Streetcar City Center Connector, and Washington State's Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture. Shannon is a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects and an honorary member of the American Institute of Architects in Seattle. She and her partners received the Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Landscape Architecture in 2011. The firm's project awards include ASLA National Awards of Excellence, ASLA and AIA Honor Awards for Design, Tucker Design Awards, and Great Places Awards from the Environmental Design Research Association. Shannon lectures internationally, frequently juries for design awards, and serves on advisory committees for universities and for nonprofits. So welcome, Shannon. Thank you, Amy. So um, for anybody who has not joined us for an AMA before, um, we're going to keep these rolling for the next few Thursdays, uh, second Thursdays of the month. Or is it first? First Thursdays of the month. And um, coming up, we have um, David Rubin and Gina Ford. We're very excited about that as well. Um, you can ask questions by adding questions to the Q&A bar on the Google Hangout, and we will pull questions to the front and post them to Shannon. So I guess to start us out, um, Shannon, we're curious. Uh -oh. Is there anything that surprises you in your daily practice? Uh, that surprises. Well, um, I feel very lucky that there are surprises all the time. Um, and I think that's why a lot of us get into landscape picture, is we're surprised about the things that we need to learn about um, with each project. Uh, I bring up sometimes that I um, ended up spending about a year um, researching rats um, for one of our projects. And um, I, it, it developed into this, I suppose, sort of fleeting hobby interest. Um, and, you know, just been learning about rat and pigeons and geology and um, local mafia, you know, like history and all sorts of things that um, uh, one wouldn't necessarily be able to predict. So I'm grateful for the surprise um, in, our, in our work. That's Super probably cool. a very general, <laughs> general <laughs> answer. I'd say one more thing that surprised me about day-to-day um, -day, uh, work as a landscape architect and particularly as somebody who um, you know co-founded a firm and so we're, we're sort of finding ourselves in the position of a business um, which wasn't in my mind at all when in a landscape architecture or even when we started the business uh, is the amount of time and headspace we spend toward like management, management philosophy, people, people management, um, leadership, inspiration, etc. And just keeping people um, happy and keeping the communications going. It's your responsibility as a firm owner and as a design leader to do that. So um, the amount that Jennifer and I in particular that we both learned about those things and continue to try to learn about um, we're constantly encountering new information and, and surprise and um, challenge in a good way um, on that side of things. All right, cool. So the joys of actually running a practice as opposed to just practicing landscape architecture. It's exciting to hear about. Um, 
What is for you then the best thing about being a landscape architect? Uh, well, let's see. I kind of um, took from myself when I answered the first one about surprise. Um, I think the best thing about being a landscape architect is being, you know, it being a, a, a useful job to be constantly educating oneself. So I feel like I'm doing something practical. I'm helping clients. I'm working for um, clients and cities and the public um, while I'm also constantly challenging myself and um, getting an education about the world. Um, there are other professions where you can, they're either, they lend themselves to that or you can make them into that kind of um, in mental environment for yourself. But I think that landscape architecture in particular, because it frustrates us in being so sort of ill-defined and broad, um, really lends itself to that. And if you're the kind of person who tends to take responsibility for um, uh, that, that sound quality just helped. Thank you. Um, if you're the kind of person who tends to take responsibility for um, curating when you see communication connects around you or you see um, things that are probably outside your scope that could be better connected, um, then as a landscape architect, you're going to naturally be taking responsibility for so much more than what would be self-evident in your scope. You're going to be trying to get politicians to talk to each other in and cease to each other and traffic engineering to work with horticulture and all other things. So um, that kind of um, all-encompassing, there's no limits, curatorial role um, feels, it's just sort of where I love to naturally end up to worry about everything um, and it's satisfying to be able to um, touch all of it and to try to better connect all of it. And that, that, that's the end of that answer that was as rambling as it was. Thank you for correcting that sound quality. <laughs> that's Daniel Martin is actually joining us from the plane currently. So um, we might be getting him in and out a little bit, but we can mute him for now. <laughs> um, I'm going to pass it to Chelsea for the next question. OK, so we want to ask, um, who or what has had the biggest impact on your career? Hmm. Who or what has had the biggest impact? Um, I find myself really more answering those singular, like, what's the best or the top or favorite sort of questions. And it might be because I have that um, scattered landscape architect brain that's trying to pull everything into the same headspace. Um, but I can I can name some, um, some influences or things that have impacted me. I feel like there's um, a huge lucky wins in terms of just timing of when I happen to discover the profession and when I happen to live and exist and find it. Um, I graduated in 1997, and um, that was sort of at a certain point of, I guess, public refocusing on design and architecture and um, and particularly like people were really interested in finding a new sort of modern or contemporary language. There was a lot of fascination with like mid-century modernism and rediscovering that and some of those guys that um, brought this sort of unapologetic design um, mentality and a modern design mentality towards solving problems. So that sort of influenced me, but I think just since then, I've been very lucky that the conversation about landscape architecture and landscape architecture as a design profession, as well as a key component of our civic quality of life, um, and a key component and player in the built environment, it's just been growing and growing, and um, more and more pressure and opportunity has been presented to the landscape architecture profession over the last few years. And so I just feel like the point in my career I've been at each of those sort of times in the recent renaissance um, 
at least the sort of recent pop re popular renaissance in landscape architecture, has been a big influence on me. Because I've gotten to participate in those conversations and also feel like they're new to me um, when they come up. So I feel that sense of novelty and urgency every time a new topic gets really pushed and that landscape architects can lead it, whether it was the sort of um, focus on sustainability when that came up and the focus on it and the cynicism and you know you have terms becoming important and then people get a little skeptical of them and then you go through that really complicated cycle every time one of those new um, challenges comes up in the public conversation about landscape architecture. Um, so that's something that I feel really lucky about with my timing and I have nothing to do with that. Um, the other thing that was probably has been a big influence for me is um, growing up and maybe forming my interest as a youth actually not knowing I was going into landscape architecture and uh, um, getting exposure to a lot of completely unrelated things. I um, had a lot of weird jobs from the time I was third grade in third grade. Um, through putting myself through college, driving a pea combine and um, a forklift, working in an aluminum plant, working in a cannery, working in chicken farms, um, which sort of exposed me to a lot of different types of people and a lot of different types of challenges and work. And you realize, well, I'm myself and have to be myself in all these different situations. And you also realize there's these similar things that you have to do to do a good job and figure out what's needed of you. Um, in that environment and there's things that you want to improve about any environment you're in and I think that's a really good um, way to prepare for landscape architecture and the different projects where you're going into a blind situation you're not familiar with this town or this landscape yet but you need to embed yourself be empathetic and become an active and productive agent in that environment um, I think that was something that really helped me Wow, okay. So you've had quite a journey getting to landscape architecture. Um, we are curious, there's a question here. Um, how did you end up getting your first landscape architecture job? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, later than a lot of students, um, we see a lot of students that have been interning in landscape architecture at awesome firms for like years by the time they graduate and I'm always so impressed by that. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, I was working in completely unrelated jobs and I was in my last semester of my um, senior year. I just had my BLA um, and I don't mean just for those other people who just have their BLA and have a master's. Um, my last semester I realized that I hadn't completed a requirement that the UW program had that you do something called a practicum which is like a, a part-time paid internship. So as usual I think I had partly delayed it because I was intimidated about contacting firms and I didn't have any related professional experience. Um, also I'm just kind of disorganized. So I um, we had been planning to go into environmental restoration um, and uh, found a local firm here that um, specialized in environmental restoration uh, in, in Seattle, I should say. So I did my practicum with this um, small local firm with um, that real focus on environmental restoration. And in my practicum, um, I did a lot of graphics. Um, that was something I could do that was useful even though I didn't have experience yet in doing la practicing landscape architecture I could um, draw. So uh, I was working on, um, I did a lot of interpretive signs actually so they kind of had like a realistic illustrative character to them um, and I really got into doing them um, and enjoyed it. Uh, some of them are still up around Seattle, like in Seward Park. There's pictures of like kids pointing at butterflies and things like that. Um, and uh, while I was doing that practicum, um, I of course started to wonder if it could flow into a job. 
um, after I graduated and, and um, was very much in suspense and it was just such a relief and I couldn't believe it when they offered me a job that I could continue working after I graduated. So I just rolled right into that and I was at that firm for three years. I met um, my partners Jennifer and Catherine while I was working at that firm because um, they were working on other projects. They were working on some of the projects in the firm as consultants. And Jennifer was actually brought on to manage one of the projects. And um, the, those projects kind of took on a life of their own. And um, as things started to change um, with some of the principals and owners, Jennifer and I decided to start our own um, company. Uh, and then Catherine agreed to join us. And this was three years. Three years after I graduated, I was 25 when we started this company. Wow. Um, and uh, I, we had no idea what we were just like, oh, we'll just keep working on these projects, but we'll just change the like, paperwork. <laughs> um, uh, I'm kind of glad we didn't know what we were doing. But the, so that, you know, in summary, I had the practicum that rolled into my first job. It was in environmental restoration, um, which isn't our specialty at GGN. You know, we still carry that priority, but um, it's kind of an illustration that sometimes if you follow the dots, they'll lead you to where you are one way or the other and um, just work hard along the way. And who knows, will you, <laughs> you may end up in a place that's very different than you thought you would. And I think it's all good. It's all OK. Okay, so um, our next question comes from Stephanie Dunn, and she asks, do you find yourself having to educate clients and other collaborating professions on projects about the profession of landscape architecture? That's a great question. Um, yes, although I don't know if it's just to keep my morale up or what, but I don't consider it for some reason, like I, I, there's like a little nuance in there. Like I don't consider it that I have to educate them about the profession, and maybe it's because if I felt that way, I would, I would be feeling really defensive a lot. Um, but I think that's always a. I think you always have to show people what you're capable of before they'll sort of give you the space to do the scale of work that you know you're capable of and that you want to do. And perhaps as a landscape architect, that comes up a little more, because our, partly because we do it to ourselves. Like There's so much variation in our profession. Some practices don't do a lot of hardscape work, or they don't care you know, as much about one thing versus another. And then a client or an architect might encounter another firm after they work with the first landscape architecture firm that has a completely different set of priorities and in-house kind of capabilities or um, values. So um, on every new project or every time I start working with a new client or architect, um, there is a little bit of a, you know, that period of time where um, there might be assumptions based on people's experiences of what you, what a landscape architect can do or should do. and um, I usually find that just by um, caring as much as we do about everything and naturally like looking into everything that we can about what makes a site the way it is. You know, when we start a project, we do a lot of research about the history of the site, the context, what are the experiences coming in, what are some issues with landform and maybe the street system that's connecting to the site. And just by simply going about our process, coming to the meetings with information and enthusiasm and concern and care that's often more than anyone else at the table has about those issues, the space will sort of like automatically form around you because people um, will realize that you're ahead of them on that in a way um, just because you know you want to work harder around those topics than anyone else does. It's not always easy um, and without conflict but more often than not, if I sense somebody underestimating us or underestimating what, lands, what our scope should be, 
um, if I kind of ignore it and um, just, you know, I know it's there. It's not like I don't sense, sense the attitude or whatever. Um, I try not to be offended by it, and I just keep doing what I know we need to do to do a good job, which is usually more than what people expect. And um, more often than not, it just that issue kind of naturally resolves itself of the, like, the education or the lack of expectations. Um, as we talked about at Labash, um, around what landscape architects can do. That's a good question. <laughs> so Esther Lim is wondering, do you have any advice for students that feel the pressure to produce quality work amongst the seemingly endless number of talented LA students? And how do you focus on our, how, how to focus on our own creative process instead of on the competition? That is one of the best questions ever because I think that's the key not just to feeling good about yourself or your, I guess, your comparative position or influence as a student but also as a design practitioner. And if you want to see like nightmare reality show of what continues to happen to people through their whole careers around that topic, um, be on architecture teams for design competitions, like high-profile design competitions. Um, people are driven crazy. You know, we're all driven mad when we start to think about other people's work or what other people are doing. Um, and then, you, you know, the tragic outcome of that is then you don't do work that's as good as your competitors. Um, and in design competitions, it's almost this like mind game that is very difficult. It remains difficult through people's careers. Um, this mind game of finding within yourself a novel and um, crucial idea or concept that will sweep yourself, you know, sweep your own mind into a creative process that will produce something intense and unique um, and passionate so that you're like naturally driven to sort of work all the details through, work all everything from the graphics and communications to the sort of design details, I guess. Um, and, you know, super simple answer to that, like how do you, how do you sort of stay focused on your own process is it's kind of obtuse, but it's stay focused on your own process. And I think the best way to do that, like when I talk to people in the office, like sometimes we, within a team, you have the same dynamic. It's not necessarily competitive, but it's, it's sort of, well, how do I feel like I'm having a creative process and that I'm bringing high quality novel content to the table at each meeting? And what I advise people to do is probably based on more what my little mental tricks are for myself. Um, but I advise people to find anything that interests you. Like, um, if you guys have a studio project and there's eight other students working on it or 30 or whatever, um, there are probably, if, if you just sort of sit back and look at the site, the place in the world, the history, um, uh, culture, or something about the program or the client, something will be of personal interest to you that seems like it's not a cool design thing. So it might be that you're interested in like, oh, you know, there's a bunch of like low rider um, car garages that are across the street from this and I'm kind of interested in cars and, you know, car culture or custom car culture. Or maybe you find an old poem book that was a favorite of somebody who used to live in a house on the site and you're at that poet, you're kind of into poetry. Um, but it doesn't have to be an arty thing, I think is probably more the point. Um, and it doesn't have to seem like an overtly designed thing, but it's just something that naturally you kind of want to read more about it or learn more about it. And it, it's almost like you have to find that road that pulls you, and it's going to feel like a distraction. Um, you're not going to know it's there until you just blank it, like just let yourself try to soak in everything about the site and try not to think about design for some 
moment of time, depending on your timeline on the project, when you start it, so that you're not putting that design pressure on yourself. You're just opening your mind. You're like, what the heck is this? I don't know anything about this place and this project. And then when you find something that just feels a little more like personally indulging to, to um, learn about it, like allow yourself to follow that, to learn more about it, to learn more about it than you probably need on the surface to design. But that will give you a point of view and it'll make the project a fun exploration and personal enrichment kind of process. And somehow I think that gives you um, fuel, you know, and also your own sense of mission and curiosity that will naturally make your work. You'll start to get that tunnel vision because you'll be so into it and hopefully not um, getting distracted as much as possible by what other people are doing. When we're on design competition teams with our architect friends and collaborators, um, sometimes we find, you know, and the building is the big thing. Like we're just there like there's a little landscape component or something. And it's easy to do this with other people as opposed to yourself, but a lot of times our role is to kind of remind everyone to stick with what was so interesting to the team in the first place and not like two-thirds of the way through the process see or hear about something that you think another team is doing and then say, oh, well, we're going to be missing that, so we need to incorporate that. That's when you start to get this mush that's self-conscious and kind of torn open and it makes you feel so vulnerable and defensive and, and that's not that's not fun, that's not really a creative process. Um, but yeah, it's a big topic and I think it's a big, uh, it should be a big focus of all of ours to make sure that we as designers have our own integrity and that landscape, architect as a de uh, landscape architecture as a design profession has its own point of view and its own design integrity um, and doesn't get into this reactionary defensive role during our project processes. We have to be coming with our own um, sense of urgent curiosity and process. Wow, so I guess just do you. <laughs> First and <laughs> yeah. foremost. <laughs> Sounds so easy. <laughs> but it is kind of a mind game. Find a way to brainwash yourself. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> so we are having a little bit of um, video lag. However, the sound quality is excellent, just so that everybody knows that it's um, still coming through. I'm going to shoot the next question over to Chelsea. Okay, so we want to know if you ever get writer's block, and if you do, what is your favorite way to overcome it? Mm. All the time. It's my biggest fear um, in a way when we're working on a project is that I'm going to um, hit that. I don't, I, um, I don't know if it's all the same. I think there's different kinds of writer's block. Um, but you kind of know that, especially after you practice for a while, you start to like recognize it coming on. And um, there's a little bit of a, I guess there's kind of a preventative measure that I can think of that I do, and then there's the kind of fix it after it happens thing. The preventative measure is, well, there's two preventative measures. One is to break yourself out of a good, comfortable place and have your work critted by somebody that you um, respect as sort of a disruptive, independent design critic. So um, we have something in the office, you know, you can't depend on an institutionalized kind of structure to do this and that the timing will be right in your specific design. But once a month we have something we call design critters um, where the kind of um, most plain spoken critical people in the office get together and rip each other's work apart. and. Um, that's so helpful. It's such a relief to have somebody come in and worry about your work. And, and then there's something you, you kind of knew that this one part of the design was a little bit kind of just hanging there. Like you haven't totally grappled with it yet. And people, if, 
if it's the right kind of critics, they'll go right there. And it's actually a relief when you're like outed. It's like, okay, yeah, this was not feeling good, so let's talk about it. And they'll lead, those people will lead the interrogation through that area that you've been subconsciously maybe, I don't know if it's necessarily writer's block, but it's kind of this like deferral of reckoning with something that you just hadn't been able to mentally attack yet. Um, so that really helps. And then another thing, you can do that to yourself. Like I often, um, if something, like we have something we think is kind of resolved and then one thing changes on it, like we have to change. We had something that was basically a bowl shape and then the architect lowers the door on one side of the bowl so it's not a bowl anymore. Um, you know, you could just change that one part of the grading but you really don't have a bowl anymore, so you really have to go back and say, okay, the concept isn't a bowl anymore. What is it? Let's, we have to rip all of this apart and redo all of this, or at least see it all with fresh eyes. Um, I often purposely go through an exercise when one thing is changed like that, where I draw a design for the space. I actually change more than I need to, to make sure that I'm not missing something, or that I'm not missing a need to reevaluate more things and it kind of drives people nuts sometimes because it's like all you had to do was change that one path and I come back and I'm like what if we didn't have a path there and we had the path going you know on the other side of the project or something but it's just that you know just making sure you're messing yourself up enough that you're seeing everything with fresh eyes because if you don't do that you're going to get to a point in the project where there's enough changes that you weren't really in mentally controlling or reckoning with that you won't be able to, there, it's very hard to um, feel and complete artistic control and like mental, like there's not a whole controlled mental inventory of everything if that, I don't know if that, it's like you're a one man band but you don't have strings to all the parts anymore. And that can lead to I guess a kind of writer's block or designer's helplessness um, far into a project. And then as far as writer's block, like once I have it, like if I'm trying to, oh, I got to, you know, think of how to resolve all these things. I got to push this design drawing forward to give to a team, you know, for the next round of work. And I'm being a bottleneck and I, I'm like, okay, I got to do this. I got to produce. Um, I have been, I totally believe in things that we read about that sometimes the clock and rhythm of when you can creatively solve a problem, like using your intuition and just getting a solution that integrates everything, you can't really schedule it perfectly and you have to kind of listen to, you might have an impulse to just walk away at a crazy time where you're like an hour before a deadline or you have one day to work on something and nothing's coming out and then you go, it's like, I'm just going to go work on this planting plan instead or something. Um, but I, I think being attuned to that about when do you have your sort of little ideas and, and or your kind of big disruptive ideas um, is really important and kind of going with that within reason as much as you can. And I get a lot of ideas um, when I'm experiencing kind of like that block when I'm running. Um, and I think it's because it's, it's, I'm forced to just... Um, space out for a while and I don't feel guilty about it and um, so when I'm running I often will either be like oh why don't we just turn it upside down or why don't we turn this aspect inside out or when I'm running I might be all of a sudden get this realization that I'm being really stubborn about something on a design that I really don't need to be that stubborn about um, which is a different kind of writer's block where you get designer stubborn block and you're defending or feeling defensive about something that you should just like, why not change it? What's the big deal? Like, we could change it and do something totally different and it would be fine. So, I think it's different for every person. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, our next question is, uh, if there was one thing you wish you could tell your younger landscape architect self, what would it be? Hmm. That's a, one of those one thing questions again. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would it be? Uh, 
I don't know. I kind of this is kind of a perverse answer, but I think all of the sort of blind anxiety that I went through about um, being stressed. I mean, I'm sort of naturally a little bit of an anxious person and stressed out. And so my first place where my I went with, with that question was like, oh well, what you know tough situation could I have saved myself from or what confused like wrong path or unnecessary stress and so I was starting to think well I shouldn't have worried about X so much but I actually think I um, I value all of the mistakes and wrong roads I went down because they teach you things and um, maybe that's what I would tell myself um, is to not feel like I'm doing something wrong or going down the wrong road if something's really um, just starting to feel unsolvable, whether it's a project or, um, you know, there might be a client or, um, you know, a job you have that you're like, oh, why did I, why am I in this job? And you're torturing yourself about whether you should stay or go and, wondering if you're wasting your time and um, I don't think time is ever wasted and I don't think a hardship within limits um, is ever a waste, especially for a designer because you have to get really good at solving problems and keeping your head clear um, or at least focused on a certain train of thought and kind of going through these obstacle courses to carry a design idea through um, all the obstacles it needs to be carried through and to connect it to all this new information um, as you go through a project. So in some ways the more mistakes you make or seemingly random tangents you go on um, and the more kind of <laughs> crappy situations you might um, find yourself thrown into, the stronger it's going to make you as a designer. So I might tell myself that. I don't know if I would uh, be surprised that I'd tell myself that because I've always kind of relished the dark side of things. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, great. So um, Esther Lim was also wondering, uh, what advice do you have for students trying to connect with the professional world? Mm. You know, I, um, from my own background and what I did, I wouldn't be in a good position to give advice because I really think I just, um, like I said about the my first job was sort of last minute and a bit random and it ended up working out great um, for me. And then... Um, uh, I kind of rolled into my job with that one um, ex experience. I think thinking of myself as being across that professional barrier from students now, um, the best way to connect with the professional world would be to do internships and, and to get um, jobs and offices where you're really going to be given work to do. Um, I know that those positions are so competitive. I can't imagine, like, if I, w the same student I was in the 1990s was um, trying to get to where I am now in terms of the kind of projects that I am so lucky to work on. And if I was trying to go directly into that world as a student, I would be facing a lot more competition than I would have been, um, and then I did. Um, but I, I think that um, participating in volunteer activities can help as well. Uh, I, I think, you know, I'm trying to think, okay, when have I met students that I wouldn't have met otherwise that I, you know, ended up keeping in touch with? And um, working on ASLA um, activities, actually like, um, like this one, <laughs> uh, and, or AIA, um, you know, in Seattle there's an AIA group that um, some landscape students were volunteering, have been volunteering for some of the like design festival stuff and things like that and I've met people that way that I'm so impressed with. Um, when you have a lecturer coming to your school, if there's an opportunity to volunteer to like pick them up at the airport or um, 
you know, walk them someplace or be their um, contact for um, showing them around your school. That is a, like, huge opportunity to make a lifelong friend because when, at least for me, when I'm flying in to a school or a college town I haven't been to before, like the one thing I have is like this piece of paper with this name and a phone number on it and then, you know, you kind of aren't thinking through everything until you're like kind of landing on the plane. You're like, what am I supposed to do now? Where am I supposed to be? And then just to have a nice person um, welcome you and, and they're, um, you know, you have a conversation in the car or the cab on the way to the, the town and you're dependent on them for information and they're organized and, and this source of like reassurance. Um, it's a nice like exchange of, it's a, a very low key way that you have more of a f equal power dynamic and just this um, nice structured calm way that you're exchanging valuable I guess um, this this dynamic of exchanging value with each other, which is good grounds for just having a nice friend kind of relationship, um, as opposed to when you go for an informational interview. There's always that a little bit of a one-sided dynamic where I know I I always end up I'm in this position of trying to reassure the person on the other side a lot more, like you know, don't worry, I'm not you know a, uh, a an emperor or something. Um, but I, I definitely suggest those kinds of opportunities being much more powerful than they may seem. Okay, great. Um, our next que question comes from Nithya Thiago, and that is, what is the most common problem you face when, while dealing with clients? Most common problem. Um, trying to think of what that would be. Um, we're uh, well. Um, you know, this is almost a uh, too easy of an answer, but um, it, I'm trying to think clients and problems. And I, I would think um, the when we've had problems that I would attribute to our interactions with clients, um, which usually isn't where the problems come from. Um, it would be when there's not a clear client um, sort of representative who's assigned to make decisions. So you actually want your clients to be um, to some degree like hard to handle and really opinionated and um, you want them to critique your work and be into it and have a lot of interactions. And sometimes working with, uh, like a, on public projects, we do about half our work as a public. Sometimes there's not one person on the client side who the buck stops with or they're ultimately the person who will direct you to you know, choose between whether you follow the direction of a design review board or um, a community, a local community meeting that you went to, or um, how much weight to give to conflicting inputs. Um, and, and there are times when it's just so helpful to have somebody directing you or making a final call on things on behalf of the client side or on, on behalf of the public. But with a public project, a lot of times you have what people call multi-headed client, which means you have a group of people or organizations that are sharing, maybe they're sharing the funding, so they're each putting some money in, um, but they're also doing a multi-headed review process. So you don't just have one client presentation, you have multiple and they'll all say different things, which is good. You know, you're getting, um, you get each, ideally, you're getting really clear, um, diverse inputs. Um, but then you also have a public process and depending on how that public process is formatted, you may get two people that were really loud at that meeting and you don't know sometimes how to place that in proper context with 
all the other thousands of people that the project is serving. So um, I guess the summary on that would be, um, and, and actually we do really look when we're deciding whether to take on a project or pursue it, we look for having a project manager or a politician or um, somebody who very clearly has personal, we want actually somebody who's unapologetically personal about their leadership and ownership of the project from the client side and that they're going to be brave and opinionated. Um, we want to make sure we agree with their ethics in a, you know, on a general level, but that usually makes the project much better as a design process. Oh, great. So Abby Leonard is wondering, how many different versions of your concept do you typically change up and toss out before deciding on the final design? And does it ever feel finished? Uh, it never feels finished. It feels, <laughs> it feels committed. Like, um, it's a good feeling when you feel like you've gotten actually past the point of still entertaining mentally it could be this other concept or should we be switching or should we be changing these kind of diagrammatic level things it's actually such a relief when you go into the mode of commit and detail and I love deta the detailing phase of projects and there it's like you have a clear assignment it's like you go into this math assignment territory which is not and by any means not part of the design process. It's That is design. You have to go into these finer scale design, gnarly 3D design um, puzzles that you're solving about the hierarchy and the masonry and how a rail is going to relate to the wall that it sits on top of. It's all part of telling that concept and expressing that geo kind of like fake geology that you've made up. Um, but you've committed to it and so you know what the story is and you're just trying to figure out the best way to tell it um, in, in the detailing. Um, that's when, when you get to that point in construction documents that you're working on all those details. The design doesn't necessarily feel finished but it feels, there's just this relief that you feel like you've committed and you can't go back and then all you can do is just go into more and more detail and make it more and more um, fit it out and articulate. Um, as far as how many concepts we do, uh, a zillion. <laughs> um, we realized early on for some reason in our, with our firm when we were doing like um, proposals and estimating the amount of our fee and our time that we spend on each phase that we tend to spend a lot more time on schematic design than a lot of the industry standards or expectations are. Um, but we found that if we really invest in schematic design, which usually includes a time or two of backing up farther than we kind of wish we had to, to reset the whole bone structure of the project and redefine the concept um, before finalizing the schematic design again and finalizing those key features and the topographical story and everything else. Um, by the time we get through schematic design, you know, we want to feel so confident about pretty much all of the major features of, I guess, the land surface and that they're all working together to tell the same story. Um, if we make that investment and we do we don't just say, oh, this one thing changed and we could complete schematic design and there's this one area we need to resolve in DD. Um, but if we put, you know, do that extra round of work and switch it up a little bit more but, and then redraw it, then we find that the DD and CD phases actually are way more efficient because you're actually going in and refining, you know, putting the flesh on the bones, so to speak, rather than being asked to put the flesh on the bones while also like going back and deciding what bones go where. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we're we kind of um, apparently people that work here, that have worked in other offices, um, 
are amazed by how many different options we look at. And um, we love options. We love people to come and show 10 different ways something could be done, but this is the way that I think it should be done. Um, but you, it's surprising how much you go back to those 10 options. If one of them you pursue and then something thwarts it, you can go back to those 10 options and pursue something else. Interesting. So um, that was really cool. <laughs> so next we have a question from Evan Davenport, and um, he says, I, well, I apologize for it not being on the top of the Q&A. We had a little hiccup with it. Um, LA seems to be growing popularity within the design construction industry. What factors do you think play into this, and what can LAs do to relay the importance of our services to policymakers and potential clients? Yeah, um, you know, that's a pretty good um, sort of conceptual segue for all of us to the Landscape Architecture Foundation event that's happening in Philadelphia um, over the next few days, because that's part of the big question that's being asked. Um, we had a conversation in our office earlier this week that was around that question, and um, I don't have the answer, but um, we talked about everything from should landscape architects be doing planning to should we be getting into politics um, to do we need like a lobbying group. <laughs> um, the profession is more popular. I think more designers that aren't landscape architects are also more interested in landscape. Um, and so there's just more visibility of design and landscape in general, and, and it's more of a popular fascination. I think partly at a really simple level, it seems like it's a little bit of a cyclical thing that happens after you have a really synthetic, um, clean the palette kind of um, time and design, people often become hungry for texture and nature and the untamed and um, life. And, you know, the millennial, kind of the 90s and the millennial time was a time to kind of rediscover minimalism and technology and um, sort of utopian Gattaca kind of stuff. So you had like the Gap Audi Apple store kind of stuff going on. And so I think there is just this it's not saying that it's superficial because it's not. We know that it's more than that. I wish that it was more driven by everybody waking up every morning realizing that the earth is in crisis. Um, but I think there's a good coincidence between our earth being in crisis and us being slow to act and there being more of a emotional hunger that people have personally to be around a richer environment and so then landscape architects and landscape comes into that. As far as like people then, you know, if they're saying, oh, I'm, I want to see more landscape in my city, I want my kids to be around more nature, um, I want my, um, and you know, in our firm we were in this discussion we had earlier this week, we were saying is, is it really about that or is it about life being more human scaled and cities being more walkable um, and landscape architects role in that because there's pedestrian engineers are missing um, at the table with transportation engineers which is really odd so we have the opportunity to fill that void but um, sorry that I'm rambling now um, what the next dot that needs to be connected if, every, if there's a popular hunger and interest in landscape and the quality of landscape in daily life is that landscape architects are the people to address that and that dot seems to be still largely um, there's sort of a really weak line there in as much as it's improved so what we started talking about in our office group um, was that we kind of need, a, I mean it's a sort of cynical direction to go maybe, but we were saying we need a lobbying group. We need like our NRA or our, um, you know, uh, um, trucking lobby 
like thinking about like how much the trucking lobby changed the landscape of North America um, is pretty remarkable. As did the automobile lobby um, at the dawn of personal automobile use in our, our cities um, a little after the turn of the century. So we were talking about the need for branding and the need for just that almost like burning in that subconscious association landscape, landscape architecture, um, streets, landscape architecture. Um, and it's, you know, the question was, well, how much of the job of the ASLA is that versus how much does it need to be more of this kind of more focused activist group that is um, a little more um, narrow in its focus um, and maybe a little more provocative and even, um, you know, risky and, and because it wouldn't necessarily be representing as broad of a community and range of interests, steady ranges of interests as um, our ASLA does such a great job of doing. Wow, oh, cool. So speaking of uh, these big topics that kind of inform what we do when we get into them and learn about them in depth, um, we have a question here from Stephanie Dunn. And oh, I'll also mention that we have about four minutes left. So this has been a really exciting hour. Um, had a great time listening to all of these awesome questions. Um, I think we have time for maybe this one and maybe one other afterwards. Um, okay, so two minutes or one minute and a half a question. Thank you. Sounds good. <laughs> so Stephanie was asking, um, are there any books that you've read that have greatly impacted your professional mindset and your design process that you would recommend? Oh, um, yeah, but of course now I'm not going to be able to think of them. I love reading. Um, the books that have had you know, the books that have impacts on me are um, not necessarily directly related to landscape. Um, and they tend to be kind of purpose read in the moment of researching one topic as opposed to um, following as much general evolution of landscape theory as some of my colleagues do that I really admire. So just with that preface, um, I think about books that like really kind of um, for lack of a better phrase, kind of like turn me on to like push me to do something one way or the other or that I think of when I'm working. Um, I remember in North End Parks in Boston um, reading uh, A Topographical History of Boston. That's the most straightforward one. But I loved the fact it was so luxurious to like be in this book that painted the picture of everything the city had been from a physical landscape perspective. Um, and I wish that every city, more and more cities are having them now, but I wish every place I worked in, it was almost too luxurious, but had a topographical history of. Um, the Jungle by Upton Sinclair was, I hadn't, I think I had read it when I was younger, but I read it when I was working on the Lurie Garden competition. And, you know, it, it's a, sort of a political, um, well sort of, it's a very um, political piece um, about the meat processing industry in Chicago and it's this, but it also is this um, constructing an environment in a sense of one person being completely entrapped in a certain environment that would seem really negative. Um, it was sort of a, a grim existence in Chicago but it painted the picture of kind of this emotional history of the city and also an exotic, radical physical environment that just like blew my mind. Um, uh, that, so it just sort of opened my mind and got me really interested in things. And I guess I have to stop there um, even though I could go on. Rats, there's a book just, just called Rats that's <laughs> written by this guy. Um, I think he writes for, out, or used to write for Outside Magazine. Um, that's a really good book about New York City. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Shannon. I'll have, um, do you want to take one last question or should we be on the way? I can take one last question if, okay, um, 
You, um, yeah. So this has been so fun, and I think we've all learned a lot, and we're all probably really excited to finish up the rest of our working days. I know I am. Um, so I'm going to pass it to Chelsea to finish, but thank you so much, and uh, this has been great. So Thanks, Amy. Yes, thank you again. Um, so our last question is, if you were given a golden ticket to visit any landscape tomorrow, where would you choose? Oh, no, another, like, what's the top? Um, I would probably go to, uh, I would um, go through South America. Um, I, if I think about this longer, I'll say, why didn't I say X or Y? But um, the reason why is um, I grew up, um, we work all over, and I love going to new places and learning about completely different landscapes. But uh, I did grow up in the western U.S., and I'm, so I kind of have, the, like, the biggest, like, memory bank for that. So from a personal indulgence standpoint, um, I've always wanted to um, take a trip that follows the transect. I've, you know, follow the transect of how the landscape changes and is connected by migratory patterns and... Um, mountain ranges and things like that, um, up to Alaska um, from uh, Washington. And I, I just like put this huge understanding, added this understanding, this dimension that I didn't have before about the kind of great gradient of landscape in North America. And so I would like to go south because there's everything from like as you move to as, across North America. Um, there's these like colors in the foliage that tend to be consistent even if the plants change as you go north and south. But there's these north-south kind of corridors where you can almost tell by looking at a plant um, by the texture of it and the kind of undertone what corridor it's from. And in the West, we have um, this sort of like hummingbird, um, blonde grass, uh, crackly, dryish green leaf kind of thing, this manzanita-y kind of thing that um, morphs in certain ways. And then um, working in Belize a bit, I think it's interesting that that kind of thing that goes through Mexico um, and parts of South America merges with the East Coast, Gulf Coast plant community and landscape and they're mingling together and then they kind of like splay apart again and then you see some of the same familiar birds you're like what I didn't know you had this completely different life down here um, that just it's just normal life for them to go back and for, to commute between you know Brazil and California um, so anyway I'd like to be able to put all that together and um, feel like it would make me a better landscape architect if I could do that someday road trip <laughs> well great yeah. on that colorful note thank you so much this has been a wonderful time thanks to everybody who participated I'm glad there were some questions Indeed. <laughs> okay signing off thanks everyone thank you thanks, Amy. thanks Chelsea bye bye